Well, I'm Carolyn Cooper, and I am a two-dimensional contemporary artist living in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hello, I'm Chris Stafford, and this is Art, the podcast where we get to know women from the world of visual arts. This is Season 2, Episode 13. My guest this week is the American contemporary artist Carolyn Cooper, whose work includes abstract, figurative, still life and animal portraits. Carolyn was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1948, one of two daughters to Imogen and Herschel Cooper. She attended high school in Nashville, Tennessee, and since she was 19, she has called Chattanooga, Tennessee her home. Carolyn's art education began at Middle Tennessee State University, and she followed that by majoring in art at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga, where she audited classes in printmaking and monoprinting. She spent time as a model in New York City before marriage and raising three children took priority. During a difficult first marriage, Carolyn found peace in focusing on her fitness and became an endurance runner. Her art proved to be her salvation through a second marriage, which ended after 30 years. Carolyn is now happily single and feels stronger than she has ever been. She says, every single day of my life has been ordained. We hear about her discipline in the studio and the profound impact of faith and perseverance on her life and legacy. Carolyn now enjoys a happy mix of art, yoga, hiking and exercise routines. She also keeps busy as a grandmother of 10 and great-grandmother of four children. Carolyn, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Now, I believe you've become a listener as well, which is even better. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm thrilled to have found you. I should have found you a long time ago. (laughs) Any favorite episodes so far, artists? You cover such a variety of subjects. I like them all. You know, it's so wonderful, uh, the cinematography and cake decorating and (laughs) along with painting. It's just a wonderful variety of of creative uh, abilities there. It's just I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Well, great. Well, welcome to the community. Thank you. So let's start with what life is like for you now, Carolyn, because I know you, you've you been married, you have a number of children and grandchildren. So give us a picture, paint us a picture of what life looks like for you now. Okay. I am an early bird. I love starting early in the morning. I, you know, I feel like that the early <clears throat> earlier is uh, time before time. It's my time. There's no interruptions. So I'm talking about walking over to the studio at 4 a.m. And um, that's where I do my real planning. Now, I might be able later in the day to to have windows of opportunity, but my real planning is done very early in the morning. I'll turn on uh, typically some instrumental music and all and um, and just go after it and know that I'm totally... Uh, involved in what I'm doing and focused. And then later in the day, uh, with all those 14 grandchildren that I have, if I need to pick up somebody at the orthodontist or pick up somebody from school or whatever, I can back away from uh, the studio and do those things. So uh, my, my prime time is early morning in the studio. And is your studio then... Uh, customized to your needs? I have just moved from <clears throat> Signal Mountain, and it had two horse barns, and one of those horse barns what I converted into my studio. It had rolling glass garage doors that I could open up if, if the weather were at all permitting, and I have two white labs that roam in and out of the studio. So being on property was really important to me. Before now I do have a studio, but it is, um, and it's in my house. I especially like having uh, the um, the ability to walk 
um, buy a piece of art and not just sit and study it. But you, know, I learned so much more <laughs> peripheral vision just walking by it, and I'll know what needs to be corrected or whatever. But I think if I had a studio apart from my house, there would be some advantages to, oh, I guess, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, having that allotted time away from the dryer buzzer or the telephone or the somebody knocking at the door or whatever. I know that that, that would be a wonderful thing too, but I particularly like living with my art before it goes out. And that means um, being able to keep it close, keep me close to the art. Do you paint every day then and have a disciplined schedule of as to how many hours you'd need to be dedicating to your art, Carolyn? I really do not count up hours. I count it a privilege to be in there. So I'm always looking for those times to be able to go into the studio. But once again, that's the reason I start so very early in the morning. No one's calling on me at 4 a.m. And um, so that is, um, that is really a, a gift and a, another gift, <clears throat> excuse me, another gift with that is I actually love getting up early in the morning. I, I wrote a little short story about, <clears throat> I think I have a sensory button on the back of my head that goes off and I don't just get out of bed. I jump out of bed and cannot wait to get out of bed. So that is a, I, maybe not the norm, but then again, maybe I'm not the norm. But um, so that is um, that's it's it's not a dedication or I need to spend eight hours in the studio. It's a I get to go over there now. (laughs) And so this is yeah, I'm I'm fairly disciplined in my entire life, though, in in all areas. How long have you been in this kind of routine where you've been able to dedicate so much time to your art? Can we back up just a, a minute here? Oh, I, I went to school uh, and studied art at MTSU, and I came out of school and immediately started having children. And when I started <clears throat> that, I could not work from my kitchen table very well. I like working large. And so I decided to uh, get into the fitness industry. And for... Um, Gosh, 20 years, I was an endurance runner and uh, started a fitness in, in just fitness thing here for the underprivileged in Chattanooga. The city of Chattanooga hired me for that. And then that, when my children got to a stage where they were occupied with school and everything, I went to um, UTC, our local university here, and I audited classes there to just to be able to be around other people creating art and I focused on printmaking uh Itali- it- Italia and then um monoprint and so that started a whole <clears throat> new um journey into the gallery world for me and so uh, I started being a gallery artist at that point and so that was when you became full-time artist then, was it? Yes. Yeah, sure. Where do the horses and the hounds come into your life? Because they feature in a lot of your artwork. Well, uh, Ben Hardaway was a, a fellow, he's no longer with us, but he's from Atlanta, and he was very successful in his business. Mm-hmm. And he decided when he retired, he wanted, he already had huge interest in hounds to breed this certain type of hunting hound. And uh, I think it was like the Becca gardening gun magazine. He was on the front cover and I took such an interest in it because it was so delightful for me being an early person. I could identify with the passion that he had for these dogs. And he said that these dogs running over the hill in the morning were just music to his ears yapping. And I thought, Ah, I, lo- I love that passion. I love that. I love that eagerness for life. Um, I have honestly always felt like it was a blessing to be um, eager to get out of bed and start the day, whatever it held, to just be in it. And I started doing these hounds, and I just 
I just really, I really just identified. And what about horses? Have you ridden in your youth? Horses came about when I took an a interest in folk art. And Purvis Young was uh, a gentleman that um, did some wonderful horses. They were very abstractly done. He he was in prison at the time, and <clears throat> the only uh, the only uh, surfaces he could find to paint on were file folders and cardboard and whatever he he could find around there. And he did these wonderful thing, things. And of course, when he got out, he um, all these things were framed and he's hanging in museums and everything. But horses, I'm sorry, that was long-winded. Horses to him were his icon for freedom. And he wanted to paint horses because he, he longed for his freedom. The movement of horses, was it that captured you your and your artistic eye? Not necessarily the movement so much as the strength and the uh well, the strength and I identified with strength of character. They're massive, they're powerful. Um uh yeah, and I'm absolutely certain the horses know more than I do. So I had great respect for them. Well, let's rewind the clock a bit, Carolyn. As you know, on the show, we do like to go back to where it all began. And for you, you were born in Detroit, Michigan in 1948. What are the earliest memories of that aspect of your life, your very early childhood? Yeah, that was a sweet time. My dad and mom are both were both from uh, Tennessee. But after post-war war two, my dad could not find, or like so many other people, couldn't find work in the South. So they decided to move to Detroit, and my dad worked for the Detroit Edison Company, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And um, it was really a, a, a sweet time. Um, I can still remember uh, there was no such thing as snow days. <clears throat> for school, a little plow came along in front of our house and plowed a, uh, a walkway to our school. And my mother walked me to school every day of my life, I think, well, when we were in, in Detroit. And I had one, I had one sister. She's no longer with us either. But um, <clears throat> my sister um, was of a different nature. I don't know, early on, uh, Mom and dad said, okay, keep the room clean, and here's your quarter. And my sister said, you can have mine. Just keep my room clean. So that was the first time I started earning money, and that was probably when I was about eight years old. What else were you doing apart from making money off your sister? (laughs) Well, I moved from Detroit when I was nine years old and moved to Nashville, Tennessee, And when I moved here to Nashville, uh, I didn't give up my my entrepreneurship. I um, I got a job. I rode the bus to a <clears throat> a clothing store in Nashville, and I was a uh, I was a model, and I worked in the store there. And uh, then I would ride the bus back home. And when I wasn't doing that, I would work for my Mom and her, my dad had built this little, uh, and we lived in a tiny little house in, in Nashville, and he built this uh, room on the back of it. And my mom took, went to cosmetology school for the first time, doing something outside the house. And my mother opened Jean's Beauty Shop in the back of our house. And so my time in Nashville, I grew up waking up to hearing the women chatter in my mother's beauty shop as getting their shampoo and set for the week. That was fun. What about school? Were you keen for school? Were you disciplined? I really, really didn't enjoy history. And so what I did was I took history in uh, summer school. And as it turned out, when I got out of the 10th grade, Uh, I was told that I had plenty of credits to move on to my senior year. So I skipped my 11th grade year. And I was always on the honor roll. And so I graduated from high school when I was 16. And then went to MTSU after that. 
And what were your interests other than that at school? You said you got into the fitness industry later, but were you a keen athlete then in school? Not in school. I played tennis, but that was it. The whole athletic career uh, began. <clears throat> uh, my uh, five children, who's no longer with us either, um, one day said, I said, I want to start running. He said, well, run around our circular driveway one time. And so I said, okay. So I did that. The next day, I ran around it twice. Next day, anyway, story goes on. And five weeks later, I entered my first race and came home with my first T-shirt, which was, and I, the addiction took. And I, and I kept running and running and running all races that I could get a T-shirt and a medal. And finally, uh, did a marathon and qualified for the Boston. But I looked at my children. I thought, you know what? I can't. I can't afford this much time in training. So I backed off of that, and that's when I started teaching fitness classes and developing the fitness industry, fitness business in Chattanooga. So what was it about the running that grabbed your imagination? Well, kind of a bittersweet story. I was going through a very difficult marriage. He, My first husband was an alcoholic, and uh, I, the running, the endorphins of running were real. I mean, they were real. So I kept running and running and running. And one day I was in a, an athletic shoe store and I said, you know, I want to run really long, but I get I can't entertain a thought that long. This is long before earbuds. And I said, he said, oh, I have somebody I want you to get in touch with. And I said, OK. And I walked out of the store. And I thought, I don't do that. I don't call people I don't know and, you know, just strike up a running time with them. But I don't know what made me do it, but I decided to call her. So I called this lady, Yvonne, and she said, come on over and we'll run uh, in the morning. We always ran early morning. And we had not gotten out of her driveway until she said, did Paul, the fellow in the, in the shoe store, tell you what's been going on in my life? And I said, no, not really. And she said, well, she said, I just lost my son two weeks prior to that. So Yvonne was running for the same reason I was running because we needed to run. <laughs> it was for our, for our, for our mental health, and we would some days we'd run a little bit and, and stop and cry a little bit, run a little bit and cry a little bit. But anyway, that's how my running career. Uh, that's that's what that was all about. It was just for my for my emotional and mental health. It was not so much physically that I needed it. Uh, in fact, it was. I probably needed to back off of that a little bit. Ended up with a lot of stress fractures and stuff like that. But um, it was it was absolutely the medicine I needed at that point in time in my life. And what ages would you have been, Carolyn, when when you were actually doing most of your running? Probably, I would say from around thirty years old to forty five years old. Do you do any running now? I'm happy to be walking. I'm 75. And so um, I've had lots of injuries and uh, I do a yoga and I do uh, those Stairmaster and different machines like that. And I do a stretching program and I'm now <clears throat> in a balance uh, program. But you know what? It, there's seasons. And I know you know this too, Chris, but there's seasons in your life and you just keep a, trying to adapt to where you are right now and getting the very most out of where you are today. If you look in the rearview mirror too long, you're going to be very disappointed. So I don't I don't look back. I, do I see people running and go, man, I wish I could do that? Yeah, I do that. But I know that that's not where I am today. And when you were younger, what sort of things were your parents interested in that they were involving you in? Were they encouraging you into art or anything in particular when you were young? I still want to tell you yes, but I can't lie. No, they weren't. Um, <clears throat> my dad, one time when I uh, when I did, my dad never looked up over his newspaper to even greet me when I came in from college. He was a very standoffish guy. Uh, I've never heard I love you from my dad. <laughs> And I'm sad about that. But my dad uh, one time told me when I told him I was going to major in art. And he said, 
Helen, you do know that art is just something that rich people do with the ec- extra money that they have. And I said, no, no. Art is like something necessary in our lives. But he didn't understand that because he was brought up during the Depression. And those those luxuries didn't come on him. He had to make a living for his family, put food on the table. So he never once considered art as something necessary. And how was your relationship with your mother? Wonderful. My mother was a very loving, kind, uh, nurturing uh, person to me and to my children. And she uh, did everything she could to make when we come and stay with her, absolutely wonderful. And even when I moved to Chattanooga, I used to tell people if I was had a bump in the road and, and needed some encouragement, I'd say, man, if I could just sit at my mother's kitchen table and have a cup of coffee with her right now, look, everything would be okay. So that's who she was. And did they eventually have an appreciation for your art? I never heard that from my dad, but my mother, yes, she did. I was um, pretty privileged in um, lots of different areas where I would have something to, whether it was a uh, opening or something or something in the newspaper or whatever, to send to my mom, and she was just thrilled with what how my what what was happening in my life. So yes. So when you turned your attention then after raising children to art, what kind of feeling were you getting from making art in those early days, Carolyn? I was getting um, relief and exposure. It was a relief from what there were, my, my art I consider to be storyboard, okay? So these storyboards are a way of journaling on canvas to me. And I journaled since I was in the fourth grade. Uh, so these these were things that needed to come out of me and be tangible. And so I'm in I'm in my art. Um, I'm, and the icons that I use for my art are simply um, chapters in a book. So uh, yeah, it's it's a very necessary thing for me. And what is that feeling of satisfaction then when you've been dedicating time to art? That I have, um, well, n- not all the time is it <laughs> satisfied because I could be very, I can make myself very vulnerable in my art, like all artists. You know, you, you, you put yourself out there. And, um, but typically, I mean, when somebody asks me, what's your favorite thing you've ever painted? I always say the same thing because it's true. The last thing that I painted, the last thing I painted is my favorite. And it's because after you've been engaged in uh, that process, you and you feel like that you've come to an end, you look back and you go, I poured myself into that and I like what I'm looking at. So is the most important thing to you then when you are working or when you finish a piece, what you think about it or the response from those that may be viewing your art and judging it? Well, I would very much like to say it's my my satisfaction that I'm only concerned about. But hello, we we do need to make a living, right? So my art also needs to satisfy other people and I've been blessed to say that it has and I'm also humble enough to say that I have taken on some oh man some horrible uh, commissions and when I do that I'm, I'm thinking don't do it don't do it don't do it don't do it and then I'm like you humble yourself and you discipline yourself to try to satisfy that person with with what they are expecting. And one of them, Chris, and I'm sure every artist, is, I mean, there are a lot of artists don't do commissions at all. But anyway, the ones that do can identify with this. There was one that was so horrible that I ended up um, printing off all the suggestions that she would make when she would look at it. And there was 
I have as she probably I probably have six pages of her suggestions. And it, after after a point in time, it got to where most people would have said, Mm-mm, I'm done. But not me. I'm like, nope, I'm going to do this thing. If it kills me, I'm going to make her happy. And so anyway, I keep I keep that uh, taped to the side of my computer. So when I get when I get really bummed out about something, oh, you remember this person <laughs> that you couldn't satisfy? And I would love to at some point say, I don't take, I don't do that, I don't. But at this point, it. It, I think it serves as a necessary thing for my growth. Did you have the confidence in your ability as an artist when you were starting off and then starting to sell work? Or has art given you the confidence and, and validated your self-worth? Yeah, very hard question. <laughs> Okay, um, I don't know that maybe other artists do not do this. I don't know. But my life has, my entire life has not been a straight uh, path. If we're talking about like, like I love to hike, okay? So if in hiking, uh, you have switchbacks. The switchbacks are not necessarily fun because you look down and think I've just been down there and now I'm just right here but switchbacks are absolutely necessary if you want to get to the top and so I've had a lot of switchbacks and so sometimes when I make our, a piece of art and I'm uh, debating whether I'm comfortable with it or not after a while I'll turn it upside down and paint over it And I turn it upside down and I like what I'm seeing in the layering. And it's like life. It's like layers of layers of layers. It adds interest and texture. And lo and behold, I'll look at it when I get done like "Mm, it's not exactly what I'm going for. And I'll turn it, turn it on its side and do again. Some of my paintings, (laughs) If you look at the back of it, because I'll, but I, because I'll title each one. And if you look at the back of it, it may be scratched over four or five times. And, but to me, that's not failure. That's a learning process. And that learning process um, gives character to the surface. I'm wondering, though, that ultimately what art has done for you, because clearly you've had two marriages and, and, You know, you've been through some difficult uh, periods of your life, Carolyn. I'm wondering where art fitted in as your salvation, as therapy? I think both. I told you I use icon in my art, and one of of my icons is is a boat or a canoe. And that icon has, uh, I don't for whatever reason, seems to have been the most popular one that I've had. And the reason I first started painting a boat is because I felt a real need to surrender. And that's basically what you do when you get in a boat, you surrender yourself to that boat. And it brings peace and stillness and rest. And um, it's everything you need for that point in your in your life or that you're going to be in that boat is in there. It's all inclusive. And you have to trust that that boat's going to keep you on the water. And when I paint a boat, it's a it's a it's much like my life and the and the and the things that I've gone through in my life. I have to continue to surrender to the moment, to where I am today, to whatever whatever this position I am now. I need to trust that this is where I'm supposed to be. I believe, I believe that every single day of my life has been ordained. And so I need to be still in it and endure it and not just endure it, but just be there, be present. And I think about too, <clears throat> it's when our, and again, I'm using this as an icon for my life, okay? Uh, that the boat is small enough to create an order and, and, and it's complete and satisfying, even though the rest 
of my life may be in chaos, that boat brings that kind of order into my life. So I know that order, uh, yes, and each and every one of the different icons do something like that. They ground me in where I am today. Give me, give me a platform for, for where I am today. Does religion play an important role in your life, Carolyn? Is it a guiding light? It's huge. It's huge. I start every day uh, after I get out of the studio and sit with the Lord for probably an hour, hour and a half. And when I say sit with the Lord, I don't mean just sit and read the Bible. I have a whole uh, variety of different things that I'm that are before me. Like I actually just jotted down the books that I read this morning. I read the Bible. I read C.S. Lewis. I re- read uh, Martha Hickman and uh, Jean Houston, which is I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she she breaks down the Wizard of Oz and calls it the Wiz- Wizard of Us for a for a, for learning. And Victor Frankel, who's a uh, Holocaust survivor, he wrote a book called Yes to Life. I read, a, I love outdoors, so I read a book called Forest Bathing. And then I read another book because I want to, um, I want to, I want to rewire my brain from any negativity. So I, I'm reading a book called Switch on Your Brain. And then, uh, speaking of books, when I, when I get ready to relax at night, I'll read uh, Anne Lamont or uh, oh, Jedediah Jenkins. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's if you haven't, you need to read his stuff. Uh, so I do a lot of reading. But so when I say I do have a very firm faith, and but I also uh, supplement the Bible with many other things that I think are bring, bringing healing to me over the over the rough spots that I've had. Art is a bit is a huge healer. Where does the religious influence come from originally, Karen? Were your parents or grandparents strongly religious? No, they were not. Um, <clears throat> okay, when I was nineteen years old, I came to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and uh, my uh, she wasn't my mother in law at that point, but she was soon was soon to be my mother in law. And I came home with the uh, father of my children and the first visit there they lived in a huge very beautiful home I did not come from that and when I told my uh, friends at school that I was coming home to visit Mike's family they said we need to pack your suitcase for you you don't have the clothes to go there and I didn't I didn't have the name brand clothes so they actually got their got my suitcase packed with their brand name clothes and I came to Chattanooga that first time with and uh, to that beautiful home with bar- borrowed clothing and anyway so we got there and Mike said uh, I'm going to go play golf with my dad and I'm like oh dear you're going to leave me with your mother that I don't know <laughs> anyway so as soon as they walked out the door she um she said Carolyn why don't you come back to my bedroom I want to talk to you about something I thought, oh, okay. And I said, okay. She said, just sit on the bed. And I sat down and she said, um, are you a sinner? I said, ma'am. She said, are you a sinner? I said, oh, no, ma'am, I'm not. And she said, oh. She said, do you know that the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? And I said, ah, oh, no, I didn't know that. I said, well, I guess I get I guess maybe I am a little bit. <laughs> anyway, the, the conversation went on from that to me saying, I don't even know the difference in Jesus and God. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what that is. And so anyway, to make, I, won't, I won't go on and on with it. But she um, she introduced me to my faith. And not only that, but she she um mentored me and tutored me in the Bible, but not only the Bible, but how to raise a family, how to clean my house, how to cook, how to whatever. She taught me those things at 19 and for several years, of course, after that. So that's how all that came about. And you know what? It took it. it he, he came in and he took over my life and I owe everything to him. And I do all of my art to the glory of God. 
And how did your mother feel about that and the rest of your family? Well, of course, I went back to Nashville and tried to convert everybody, but uh, <laughs> they, did, they, did, they were going to have any part of that. <laughs> when did you feel that you were facing your biggest challenges in life when your marriage started to go awry, your first marriage, and you would have been quite young still? What were those milestones, those landmarks, if you will, where you were facing life's biggest challenges? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those were the switchbacks. Um, well, and I'm, let me, uh, the father of my children, Mike, I told you he was an alcoholic. And uh, let me also tell you that he got sober and made up for all the years that he was not a father to my children. And so he, before he died, he was a wonderful man. But while he was not before that, he was not a wonderful man, and um, he was uh, abusive. And I was being the good little Christian wife who was uh, an extension of her husband. When I think about the times back then, do you know that in the newspapers, I was women were not anything but Mrs. So and So. They never had a first name. It, it recorded in the newspaper. And so I was Mrs. Mike Austin. And so being Mrs. Mike Austin and being a Christian, I thought my duty is to enhance him. You know, I'm not really a person. I'm just an appendage or whatever. And so when I, uh, when, when two of his friends knocked on our door at 5.30 a.m. one morning and said, Mike, we're taking you to rehab. I said, oh, no, you're not. No, 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 no. I can do this. I can I, I can make this thing right. We No. And they said, Carolyn, why don't you go back to the bedroom? We're going to be here with Mike for a bit. Anyway, he went. they took him to rehab, and he got sober and clean and stayed that way. So that changed the dynamics in our home. I had always been the one in control of the children and the house, whatever. And he, when he got sober, he thought he was going to be. And I thought, hmm, I don't think that's going to work. So anyway, I, I kind of saw the um, the um, prison door open. And so I thought, you know what? I need, I need to get out of this marriage. And I did. And so that's what happened there. And I, um, and again, I, I'm very grateful that he he got sober and clean and was a wonderful man before he died. If you could rewind the clock then to those difficult periods in your life, what advice would you give yourself to move on from there, to find a way forward? I'm sorry to tell you this, but I didn't know I was a real person. I just thought I was a shadow of him. And even in... Uh, even when I started, I was sorry. I was I did junior league work consistently, and I, and I was working. And they wanted me to come on board as one of the officers. And uh, Mike said, "No, that's enough of that. I want you out of the junior league. You're not going to go any farther with that." And so I had to quit quit doing work with them. So what I'm telling you is, there was a different mindset then, and I don't know whether it was just the South or what. But uh, women were uh, not thought of as uh, as stable, independent, intelligent human beings that could choose their own way. And I guess that's what I would caution. I don't think that that even goes on today. I would have wished that I'd known that then. But by leaving the marriage, did you feel empowered? Did you feel you were finally taking agency over your own life and your own identity? Absolutely, absolutely. But I still had a had, I still hung on to this thing that that told me that um, I had the ability to. If I spun around fast enough and did the right things and performed the right way, then it might change somebody else's behavior. That I've learned that that's not the case. I need to be in control of myself. 
I cannot control someone else's behavior. So that has been empowering. Um, yeah, that's that's been a real eye opener. Even in my second marriage, that was what that came down to. And has that helped you being a parent today, you know, as you've evolved, as you say, through the seasons of your life and the generational changes and attitudes towards women and women's empowerment? Has that helped you with your own children? My own children have helped me. I hate to uh, confess ignorance, but um, I'm a very honest person. And my children saw what was going on in my second marriage and said, Mom, you're being mistreated. You're being abused. You get out of it. And I said, no, 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 no. Things could change. Things could change. I'm going to hang on. I can do this. I can do this. And um, they did a wonderful thing for me. They said, either he goes or we go. Well, Chris, I have 21 family members that were ready to no longer associate with me if I continue to be abused, allow myself to be abused like that. So I wish I could be the wisdom in this family <laughs> and tell you I've taught my children. But if anything I've taught my children is that things, you can change your life. You can change things. You can change, you can turn your canvas upside down and start over again. It can happen that way. And that's what, that's what my life has been about. It's been, um, uh, uh, coming to grips with uh, honest feelings and knowing that if you start again, it, it, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Do you feel that at this point in your life, you're stronger than you've ever been? Yes, I do. I'm single and I'm old and I feel great. I have lots and lots of energy and I have no intention of ever stop making art. I'm blessed to be able to be in an occupation that that you really, that, that I love. And I love my art. I love writing. I love being with my family and I love, I like, actually like being by myself. I do have two. I do have, well, I do have two dogs that I talk to regularly. (laughs) (laughs) And your children, Paige, Polly and Michael, have they inherited any artistic traits? No, they haven't, but my grandchildren have. I have one uh, grandson, Austin, who um, went to work as an apprentice in a uh, in a place called Set in Stone that made concrete um, objects, and and sometimes sometimes they were functional, and sometimes they were just ornamental. But Austin has really progressed in that in that area, and and I love that about him. And I love that for him. Yeah. And I have several children that are painters. And I have uh, a a four and a six-year-old that come over here and do art with me. And I think they're wonderful. I think one of the reasons I I so love folk art is that I think about it being uh, childlike, you know, and I just appreciate their honesty. Do you enjoy being the grandparent that maybe you didn't have the grandparents yourself? But you'll be, you've become that grandparent you wanted to have yourself. I do enjoy that very much. But I also know that, again, there are seasons. There was a season when the grandbabies were little. There was a season where uh, in a church we would take up an entire row and we would come back to my house and uh, I would serve Sunday lunch to, you know, 21 people. And uh, now... That's not the case. It's, the, believe it or not, those kids grew up and they got cars. And when they got those cars, they found out they didn't have to go over to grandmother's house. They could go be with their friends. And so <laughs> they started choosing other things besides me. But I will say that they all come by and see me on occasion. And it's, and it's wonderful. And call and text. And, but we stay, we stay close. So they're probably very proud of you as an artist, too. I'm wondering who your biggest influences were as as an artist. Whose work were you admiring throughout your formative years? Louise Bergeron. Her work, number one, is massive. I love big. If, if, If I like looking at it small, I love looking at it big. So she has these massive 
spiders. But when I learned that she she created she started creating those spiders because they uh, they were in honor of her mother. Her mother was protective, and um, and it was a maternal thing that she, the reason she did these these spiders. And so I really, really appreciate that. And I really appreciate, appreciate being able to see one. So I, I would think she's had a huge influence on me. And of course, Helen Frankenthal, I, who wouldn't want to be her? Um, <clears throat> she <laughs> to stand on canvas and make these wonderful, beautiful things and uh, just be full body, you know, being a physical person. I just, I just, I was very, very, very into watching her produce her art because I love the idea of using your whole arm or your whole body or your whole self and making art. What would you consider then now, having had a life in art, to be the highlights of your artistic career? Probably my most recent project is um, I, I've uh, not con- I haven't given up painting on canvas, but I also paint on different surfaces. I paint on cardboard and I paint on tar paper because I like giving honor and to those, especially after the after COVID and all this packaging that we get, I'm ashamed to say on my door, I wanted to do something with some of that cardboard. And so I you know, and I like the idea that cardboard has a facade on it, two facades actually, but the the strength, of course, is in the interior of it where that ridge is. That's where the strength comes from. And so, does that not just scream of of, of yourself? You know, you, that's who you are. You just have a facade on, but what's on the inside of you is what really gives you strength. And then the tar paper thing, um, I love because I paint from dark to light and. I thought I had a roll of it for some reason in the studio. I looked at it. I wonder if I can paint on that. And I researched it and thought, yep, we can do it. And so that tar paper uh, used in its typical function goes underneath the shingles on a roof and is good for 30 years in outdoor weather. So I thought this is a pretty sturdy thing that nobody ever sees and that I want to bring to life that it's really really quite beautiful and has a great surface to it so those things are um those things are on the burner right now and also i've illustrated a children's book and also have have a uh the first draft of a new children's book so i want to i'm i'm excited to do that well i was going to ask if there's anything that people wouldn't necessarily know about you I also want to know a little bit more about the modeling that you mentioned earlier um, that you did in your early life. Now, is that something that people wouldn't know about you? Is What, what, what more is there to tell? <laughs> I did that because I didn't have those brand name clothes and I wanted some money. I wanted to be able to buy those clothes. And so today I would never dream of putting a 15-year-old on a bus to go downtown at night after school to work in a place and stand in a window being a uh, a still mannequin uh, for hours on end uh, and just and so that's what I did. It was it was uh, a static model. Um, I had done some other modeling too, but that that was the one I did in high school, and <laughs> it was pretty funny actually. And what's the other modeling? The other modeling is, well, there's been several different ones. Um, um, What's a basement in New York that just closed? Uh, It's not Feinstein's basement. (laughs) I'm drawing a blank right now. But I did some modeling for them. Uh, Sockwell, who produces these wonderful socks, they started with me and they said, okay, we we want socks for every age. We want them for 40 year olds. You know, those that thought 40 was oh, 40s, 50s, 60s. We want in every category. So they kept calling me in, calling me in, calling me in. And so anyway, then <laughs> when I turned 70, they called me. I said, you always say 60s. I don't see anything in there about 70s. At 70s, are you supposed to just like give up? 
<laughs> because even the cosmetic world, you know, they sh- they show cosmetics all the way up to 60 years old. I thought, okay, do you just forget this? Once <laughs> they go after that, but anyway, they they had uh, done stock modeling. <laughs> It's pretty funny. How did these modeling jobs come about there, Carolyn? Um, they came about because Stockwell is a Chattanooga company. And in Chattanooga, um, maybe, I don't know, I'm well, people know me in Chattanooga. So they, they knew me. Okay. And still there's more modeling to come then on the side? No, nobody wants a 75-year-old. Nobody. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm not going to bank on that one. What would you like your legacy to be? My legacy is never give up. I um, my my daughter said that this is a very uh, depressing thing, but uh, Chris, I keep up. I'm all old, old school. I, I still use file folders. Um, and one of the files that I have are rejections. And I keep rejections in there, whether it's from an art residency, and I've done several of those that I very much enjoyed doing, but um, some that I have, I've applied to that I didn't get in. I've applied to galleries that I haven't gotten in. And every time they, I get a rejection letter, um, I file it away and, and Paige, my oldest daughter said, why do you do that, mom? I said, because when I'm gone, I know you guys are going to go through all my stuff. And I want you to see <laughs> that none of it's come easy. You just keep on keeping on. It's again, it's turn that canvas around, do it again, try it again, try it another way, say it a different way. Um, take the switch back and it's, you're going to get where you want to go if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And finally, where can we see your work? Do you have workshops this year or work in galleries that we should know about, Carolyn? Well, um, I'm going to simplify that for you because it was in nine galleries in the southeast. And the one gallery I wanted to be in in uh, Atlanta said, we really want to, we want to show your work, but we, we want an exclusive on your work. And I said, oh, dear, because... I mean, I grew up in Nashville, so I'm going to stay in that gallery, in ben- Bennett Gallery in Nashville. And I was here at 1401 and loved being in 1401. And, and But I did go in the gallery in Atlanta, Greg Irby. And so I pulled all my work out of all the other galleries. because, And, and really thankful. I mean, I'm thankful for all those galleries, okay? But I like, I like paint, any other painter. Painters want to paint. They don't want to do the book work, the inventory work, and transitioning work to, to from uh, picking up work to taking work to that kind of thing. And uh, although I had employed my older driving grandchildren to do that, and they loved it because I always overpay grandchildren. I think <laughs> and they recognize that. But I'm glad that I've, I've reduced my galleries down to three. And what are you most looking forward to this year? This year, this year, this year. Okay. Um, I'm looking forward to signing up to do a um, Central Rural Kitchen uh, stint with Andres, uh, Jose Andres. He goes to... uh, he goes to areas that are depressed and he sets up uh, a kitchen and he feeds the people. And I'm very much looking forward to doing that. And where will you be doing that? Well, he has places all over, everywhere. So I can pick and choose where I, wherever I feel like going. I was really a little bit offended when I first signed it up for one because they said, we do not have any uh, needs in your area in a, and I emailed him back and I said, excuse me, I think there are needs all over the world. And I'm really, I'm okay with that. I said, is it because of my age? And they quickly sent me back a list of places that I could go because I'm very, I'm very energetic. I'm strong and I am very capable. So I can do the work. Well, it sounds as if there's lots to look forward to in the future then, Karen. Absolutely. I look forward to talking to you. That that was a real treat.
My thanks again to Carolyn, and don't forget to scroll down the show notes to find the link to her website and social media. And whilst you're on Instagram, do check us out, give us a follow, post any comments or questions, suggestions for guests. We can be found there at The Art Podcast. That's, of course, art with two A's. And also on Facebook, you can find us at art. You can also reach us via email at hollowellstudios at gmail.com. I'll be back next week with another guest from the world of visual arts, so I do hope you'll join me then. Mm-hmm.